Okay, welcome to uh, Earth Talks uh, Spring 2022. This is the second uh, time that Chris Forrest and I have run this series. Uh, last year was on energy and climate policy uh, part one. This is energy and climate policy part two, uh, Pat, strategies for getting to net zero. And the, uh, we are very fortunate today to be able to start out with uh, Mike Mann uh, from our own Penn State. Mike has a distinguished career as a climatologist. He did his undergrad at Berkeley, actually in physics and applied math. And then he transferred and did it, well, he did his PhD at Yale starting out in physics and getting two master's degrees there as I understand, Mike. But then, then he found the, the good life in geophysics and uh, became a climatologist. So he taught then at University of Virginia till 2005, and then he came to Penn State at that time, and he's now a distinguished professor here. Mike has a number, a whole list of awards that he's won during his career. I'll mention just a few. He's a fellow of the American Meteorology, Meteorological Society, a fellow of the American Geophysical Union. And in 2020, he was elected to the U United States National Academy of Sciences. Mike has written several books on climate change during his career. His most recent one from just about this time last year is called The New Climate War, The Fight to Take Back Our Planet. And that book was runner up for the Financial Times Best Business Books of the Year and was named one of the 15 best science and environmental books in, of 2021 by the Times. He, uh, he also was the, one of the co-founders of a blog on climate called realclimate.org that has been very influential. And then most important for today is that he was one of the participants in Glasgow at the COP26 uh, climate conference back in November. And so uh, Chris and I have invited him to lead us off this term uh, and tell us what his impressions were from that summit. So Mike, uh, we're glad to have you and take it away. Well, thanks so much for that kind introduction, Jim, and, and thanks both Chris and Jim for organizing this series. Um, uh, I'm really uh, looking forward to speaking to you all today about, you know, what is, after all, the defining challenge of our time. It's not the pandemic. We'll get past the pandemic, and we will still have an even larger crisis, uh, the, the climate crisis, uh, looming in the background. So um, I, I should actually point out that I was not uh, in Glasgow. Um, I was participating, but only uh, virtually um, and remotely. I, I oh, was okay. To <laughs> keep up with the, uh, the conversation and weighing in uh, where I could to, to try to provide some insights. But, um, but yes, that's uh, what I'm going to talk about here today. Let me uh, share my screen. And uh, Can you all see my uh, first overhead there? Yes, we can. Great. All right, well, well thanks again. So what I'm gonna talk about is what I see as the right path to decarbonization. Um, and you know, wh where do we go from here now with Glasgow behind us? Um, there are different paths one could take. I'm gonna talk about some of the different paths and, and I'm gonna argue that uh, you know, ultimately the problem really comes down to stopping the, you know, the problem at its source, which is our ongoing carbon emissions, uh, rather than, for example, uh, techno fixes or other solutions that sort of kick the can down the road, uh, potentially at a, at a great opportunity cost, the opportunity of doing everything we can now to decarbonize our economy. So let me start out by talking about the basic projections that were made a half century ago, the better part of a half century ago. And I could show you the projections that were made by climate scientists and climate modelers. But what I'd rather show you are projections that were made by none other than ExxonMobil. ExxonMobil, the world's largest publicly 
traded fossil fuel company, their own scientists back in the early 1980s made a prediction of how much of an increase we would see in carbon dioxide concentrations under business as usual if we remained uh, addicted to fossil fuels and continued to burn fossil fuels, the levels of carbon pollution we would see in the atmosphere by now, and how much warming uh, we would see. And they were dead on. Uh, they predicted almost precisely both the levels of carbon in the atmosphere and the warming that would result from that. And it's really remarkable because that required them obviously to be able to predict the warming uh, potential, the warming effect of uh, carbon pollution, but it also required them to predict what we would actually do. And in fact, we followed this fossil fuel intensive pathway in large part because of efforts by fossil fuel companies like ExxonMobil to block efforts to actually do something about the problem. In their own internal report, their scientists refer to the potential consequences of business as usual warming of the planet as catastrophic, potentially catastrophic. Those aren't the words of Al Gore. Those aren't uh, my words, the words of any leading climate advocates. Those are the words of ExxonMobil's own scientists back in the early 1980s. But as we know, instead of coming forward with what they knew, with what they had found, they instead uh, engaged in an effort to discredit scientists, independent scientists who had come to precisely the same conclusions that their own scientists had secretly come to. And as a result of those successful lobbying efforts, we have a much uh, more uh, challenging, uh, a far more challenging course that we have to pursue here. Um, if we had acted decades ago when we knew we had a problem, we would have been able to reduce carbon emissions fairly gently. It would be a fairly gentle transition away from fossil fuels towards renewable energy and clean energy. But what decades of inaction have bought us is now a far steeper trip down that slope. We've got to bring carbon emissions now down by a factor of 50% within this decade if we are to avoid with any degree of confidence warming the planet beyond one and a half degrees Celsius, a level of warming three degrees roughly Fahrenheit where we start to see the worst consequences of climate change. But the consequences are already playing out. We're seeing the impacts of climate change now playing out in real time on our television screens, in our newspaper headlines, in the form of unprecedented heat waves, new record temperatures seemingly every year now, part of a larger pattern of increasingly severe and frequent intense heat waves. And of course, you take the heat, you combine it with more widespread drought um, in subtropical and mid-latitude regions in the summer, and you get the sorts of unprecedented wildfires that we've seen uh, burning out west, um, California, Colorado, of course, we've seen a very recent example of that. This I've always thought uh, it was a fairly ironic article. This is exactly uh, as it came up on my computer screen when I read it last spring. Um, Washington Post article that was talking about the upcoming drought um, and water shortages and fire danger that California was facing going into that season, going into that fire season. And it was brought to you literally by ExxonMobil. The ExxonMobil banner appeared at the very top of that article. Uh, and indeed, this was brought to you by ExxonMobil and other fossil fuel companies who have blocked efforts to do something about the problem. Images many of you have seen uh, that uh, awful uh, Colorado, deadly Colorado wildfire um, that we saw just um, a couple weeks ago. It's not rocket science. You take unusual warmth, you take drought conditions, you put them together, uh, you combine that with a strong jet stream, strong westerly winds um, and severe downslope winds. All those factors come together to give you the worst, most damaging wildfire that California, that Colorado 
has seen. And this is a pattern where we've seen most of the largest and deadliest wildfires in Colorado, uh, California, Nevada, Arizona, Washington, Oregon in recent years. And it's not just North America. It's Australia, where I spent a sabbatical two years ago during what came to be known as the Black Summer, this summer of unprecedented heat and drought and wildfires that spread out across the Australian continent. I just happened to arrive in time to witness all of that um, in my sabbatical in Sydney to ironically, a, a sabbatical that was set up years in advance to work with scientists at the University of New South Wales in Sydney to understand the impacts of climate change on extreme weather events in Australia. Well, instead I arrived to witness the most extreme example in Australian history. And scenes like this, like that Lake Tahoe scene uh, are seared into our consciousness now. They inhabit our, our nightmares. Um, the, you know, this kangaroo looming in the foreground of this um, inferno. Now, this is the same region. This is in New South Wales. It was uh, a little less than a year later. And that's not, you know, your eyes aren't deceiving you. That's a house floating down a river. And it's not a houseboat. It's not, um, uh, no, it's uh, an actual house that is floating down a river. The same region saw unprecedented flooding following And this underscores something that is in fact a robust finding uh, of climate model simulations. It might sound like a contradiction, but it's not. We expect to see greater extremes at both end of the hydrological uh, spectrum, uh, worse droughts and, and wildfires, but also more intense flooding events. And we're seeing that play out. We're seeing that play out in Australia, California, the Western US, Europe, the Eastern US. That's a scene some of you will recognize as we drive into Philadelphia coming from the West. Um, that's the that underpass that you go through on your way into Center City, uh, Philadelphia. And it was literally submerged by, I don't know, something like 20 or more feet of water. Um, due to the remains of Ida, this tropical storm at that point. Uh, it was a tropical storm uh, that had picked up huge amounts of moisture when it formed in the Gulf of Mexico over very warm ocean temperatures. Um, it became a very intense category four storm. It entrained a lot of moisture into it. And ultimately that moisture came out in the form of record flooding as it traveled east, um, as it hit urban locations like Philadelphia and New York City that have poor drainage and uh, become sort of focal points for the sorts of disastrous flooding that we saw play out there. And of course, uh, we saw and have seen flooding uh, here in our part of the state. Um, you know, again, the impacts of climate change are now hitting us where we live. Just this uh, winter, uh, we saw the, the effects of that, um, the California wildfires that had produced all of this um, ash, and then you get those heavy winter rainfalls um, and you get massive uh, debris flows of, of mud and ash um, like uh, this, this um, event that took out part of Highway 70, Inter Interstate 70 in Colorado. Read about the flooding in Washington state. Um, this winter. Um, and speaking of flooding, many of you probably saw this article in Rolling Stone uh, a few weeks ago, a couple weeks ago, uh, about the, uh, um, the, 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 the Thwaites uh, Glacier, uh, sometimes known as the Doomsday Glacier. Of course, some of our colleagues, Richard Alley, Sridhar Ananda Krishnan, have been among uh, the leaders in, in, in studying and understanding what's happening uh, with that glacier and what's happening with um, the Antarctic ice sheet, the West Antarctic ice sheet in particular. Um, but we are seeing the destabilization of the ice shelves that help support the ice sheet and provide buttressing for it. And if those ice shelves collapse, 
and we could start to see massive loss of ice from the inland ice sheet that would contribute not feet, but meters of sea level rise. Now, uh, here I'm going to make a little bit of a news. This is actually embargoed until 4 o'clock AM tomorrow morning. So if there are any journalists watching this, please respect the embargo. But it is a study I'm a co-author on that will appear tomorrow looking at uh, the ocean heat content, the latest numbers. Um, and it turns out that 2021 will be the warmest year on record when you look at the ocean heat content, not just the surface, but looking at the accumulated heat content of the oceans. And that'll be the sixth record in the last six years. So that ocean heating is destabilizing ice shelves, is helping facilitate the potential collapse of ice sheets, as we've seen. So this stuff is playing out in real time. Um, this is the face of climate change. It is no longer subtle. And no place is safe from it. No place is safe from the effects of sea level rise and extreme weather events and all of the impacts that we are now seeing play out. Now, uh, Jim mentioned uh, my most recent book, The New Climate War, in, in uh, his kind introduction. Um, and in that book, I talk about the primary obstacles right now to climate action. And they include not so much denial anymore. We've seen denial largely take a back seat as the impacts become obvious, as it becomes simply uncredible to uh, argue that climate change isn't happening. So the forces of inaction, as I call them, uh, fossil fuel interests, those promoting their agenda, those looking to block the decarbonization of our economy, have moved away in large part from outright denial of the basic evidence towards other tactics like deflection, deflecting attention away from the needed policies to individual behavior, as if it's all just about you and me and our you know, lifestyle choices. Um, division, getting climate advocates fighting with each other um, over you know, uh, lifestyle choices or really anything that they can use to, to divide and conquer the climate movement. Doomism, uh, ironically, if we become convinced that it's too late to do anything about the problem, it potentially leads us down the same path of disengagement as outright denial. And so doom mongering and despair mongering are a potential threat to us taking the needed actions to avert catastrophe. And last but not least is delay, kicking the can down the road, arguing for techno fixes down the road that will somehow magically solve this problem in the future as a way of taking the pressure off of the need for us to decarbonize our economy now to solve the problem the only safe and reliable way to stop burning fossil fuels, to move away from fossil fuels. And so there's an, there's an op-ed I published uh, a couple months ago in the LA Times sort of um, highlighting how you know, delay has become the new denial. This is one of the primary tactics today that is used to block efforts aimed at climate action. You see these sorts of arguments often from you know, conservative politicians, uh, Marco Rubio, who tells his fellow uh, you know, uh, Floridians that um, you know, we just need to adapt to climate change. We just need bigger coastal defenses. Um, we don't need to reduce carbon emissions. Similar messaging from uh, the conservative prime minister, Scott Morrison of Australia who has really blocked meaningful climate action in Australia. The idea that uh, it's all about resilience and adaption, adaptation rather, and, and uh, new technology, innovation, that technologies will come along that'll solve the problem for us. So you know, we can just wait for them to come along. Or geoengineering. This idea that we can engage in other massive interventions with the global climate system, uh, which include uh, putting sulfate aerosols into the stratosphere to try to block out some of the sun to offset the warming effect of greenhouse gases, um, or massive carbon capture and burial, 
sucking the carbon back out of the atmosphere using artificial technology. And the list goes on and on. But what all of these geoengineering schemes have in common is that whether or not we might need to resort to some of them, like carbon capture down the road, too often they are used today as an argument that, hey, we will have a solution to the problem soon enough, 10 years from now, 20 years from now. So let's invest in research and development while we continue to burn fossil fuels. And of course, if we do that and these magic solutions don't come along, then we bear the opportunity cost. We're now too far down the, ro the road uh, because we burned through our carbon budget. As I said before, we've got to reduce carbon emissions by 50% within the decade and bring them down to net zero by mid-century if there is to be any hope of keeping warming below that dangerous one and a half Celsius, three degrees Fahrenheit. And geoengineering too often is used as a crutch by the forces of inaction to delay action to kick the can down the road so that they, or those they're advocating for, can continue to profit from the extraction and sale and burning of fossil fuels. And so it's not, no mystery as far as I'm concerned that Rex Tillerson, the former CEO of ExxonMobil, sees geoengineering as the solution to the problem. It's a very convenient solution if uh, you want to continue to, uh, to make, um, and, 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 and to enable um, massive fossil fuel industry profits. Bill Gates, um, who's argued for sort of a, a very technocratic um, uh, approach to the problem, uh, geoengineering, carbon capture, uh, next generation uh, nuclear uh, technology. And we can talk about the efficacy um, of, of this sort of technology, but it's unproven at scale right now. And by the way, uh, Bill Gates is personally invested in many of these technologies as for for-profit ventures to implement geoengineering and to create this sort of new generation um, of nuclear technology. And all of this is used to argue that we need new technology because we have no solution to the problem now. And Bill Gates talks down the role that existing renewable energy can play today in decarbonizing our economy. And by talking down existing renewable energy technology ends up motivating riskier and unproven technologies to deal with the climate crisis. Um, this is a very risky path forward as far as I am concerned. And do you really wanna trust the only planet we know that supports life, including us, to you know the guy who gave us Windows 95? I mean, it's a legitimate question to ask. It's legitimate to mock this sort of thinking. And indeed, some of you may have seen this new film, Don't Look Up. Um, it's the latest film by um, uh, Adam McKay that really uh, does mock the forces of climate inaction and the idea that we can just engineer our way out of the problem using unproven technologies. The movie is um, you know, ostensibly you know, about a comet that is going to strike Earth, uh, but as the, the director Adam McKay uh, has stated, it's a Clark Kent uh, level disguise, a very thin disguise of a message, a cautionary tale about the climate crisis and the danger of relying on technocratic uh, solutions rather than solving the problem the way we know how. And I won't give away the plot of the film and the ending of the film because I want you all to see it. It's definitely worth seeing. And uh, I've seen it. I've written a review about the film. I wrote an op-ed in the Boston Globe about the message of the film. There's a character in the film, uh, Peter Isherwell, who is a tech billionaire. Um, frankly, it's sort of a is a combination of a number of tech figures. Uh, there's some Elon Musk in there. There's some Jeff Bezos. Uh, there is um, there's certainly some Mark Zuckerberg um, in his character. But there's undoubtedly Bill Gates in this character. And indeed, in the film, he argues that the solution to this approach in Comet, rather than blowing it up as soon as we can, is to 
actually mine the comet, break it up into pieces and mine it for the valuable uh, ore, the valuable metals that are contained therein. Trust him, trust his for, for profit venture. Um, he will solve this problem for us. Uh, and again, I won't say how it ends, um, but that is one of the prominent figures in the film representing sort of the voice of technophilic, um, you know, uh, Silicon Valley billionaires who see problems like climate change as something we can engineer our way out of and that they can make huge profits off of by selling and implementing that technology. Now, the star of the film is the scientist um, uh, played by Leonardo DiCaprio, who's trying to warn uh, the public and policymakers about this impending crisis. And I have no idea who that scientist uh, could possibly be based on, um, who, who might have inspired that scientist. There's really no way of knowing that. Um, but the point made by the scientists is, you know, um, there's a safe way to solve this problem. And uh, maybe we should listen to the scientists rather than the tech billionaires. Please see the film. There's some really important messages in there. And it's also characteristically funny as I find uh, all of Adam McKay's films to be. So the right path forward on climate change, as I've alluded to before, is to solve this problem the way we know how, the obvious way. Um, at its, to, to solve it at its source, which is our ongoing addition of carbon pollution to the atmosphere, to decarbonize our economy. And easier said than done, but it is doable. There is you know, a pretty solid literature now suggesting that we have the technology now, existing renewable energy technology and storage technology and um, efficiency efforts, grid technology, we have it within our means to decarbonize our economy, to bring carbon emissions down by 50% within this decade. It's not a matter of technology. It's not a technological obstacle that we face. It's a political obstacle that we face. Having the political will to simply incentivize and scale up the existing technologies that can decarbonize our economy. And so I like to emphasize both urgency and agency when it comes to uh, tackling this crisis. Urgency, we've already seen the evidence for urgency. And you know, as if we needed more evidence, of course, the COVID-19 crisis, the pandemic has been a deadly crisis. Um, it'll be five, uh, five million uh, people uh, so far. Some estimates suggest perhaps 10 or even 15 million people have died because of the COVID-19 crisis. But by some estimates, climate change is already costing 5 million lives a year. And unlike COVID-19, it won't be largely in our rearview mirror within a few years. Those deaths will continue on. So the climate crisis in the long term is a far deadlier crisis than the pandemic. Um, this is the defining crisis of our time there couldn't be greater urgency. But that has to be paired with agency. We have the solutions to this problem. We can talk, for example, about the role of nuclear um, energy in decarbonizing our economy. There's a worthy conversation to be had about that. I know Jim you know, has some, some thoughts about uh, that as well. But we do have the technology to solve this problem. And by the way, the levelized cost of uh, renewable energy today, and these are the latest numbers just in, uh, Lazard's latest estimates of the levelized cost of different forms of energy. Renewable energy far cheaper um, than uh, other forms of energy. Now, there are issues that have to be worked out about capacity, about storage, uh, base load. These are all real issues that need to be dealt with, but there are is existing technology to deal with those issues. So we have the technology to solve the problem. We've seen some real inroads in the United States and Australia, around the world, the wind and solar boom is here. We're seeing huge inroads um, when it comes to renewable energy capacity. 2019, 
we saw carbon emissions really start to flatten. And the IEA said for the first time they could say that the reason for that, it wasn't an economic uh, downturn or anything of that sort. It was the increased market share of renewable energy around the world. It's happening. The transition is happening. Carbon emissions are flattening. Now, of course, we saw them come down about six or seven percent during the pandemic. A uh, new study just came out today. They're back now about six percent. So much of those that reduction was a response to short term you know, uh, policy changes, reduced transportation, shut down, lockdown policies that slowed down the economy. That was a temporary uh, decrease in carbon emissions. And we're now basically back where we were. So the good news is it really does look like carbon emissions have flattened. They don't continue to go up every year. And we know that renewable energy is playing a role in preventing those emissions from going up. That's the good news. The bad news is they've got to come down as much as they did during COVID-19, 7% or so, every year for the next decade if we are to reduce carbon emissions by 50% which we need to do by the end of this decade to remain on this path for keeping warming below that truly dangerous one and a half Celsius, three degree Fahrenheit. So obviously temporary measures, lifestyle changes, that's not going to do it. We need to fundamentally decarbonize our economy. The conservative IEA, the International Energy Agency is no cheerleader for renewable energy. They have um, traditionally vastly underestimated the uh, increased penetration of renewable energy, um, the increased growth of renewable energy. But even they have been pretty blunt about it. If we are to reduce carbon emissions by the necessary amount, and they say it's still possible, there can be no new oil, gas, or coal development, no new fossil fuel infrastructure. That means we need policies that disallow new fossil fuel infrastructure immediately. Now, we're not there yet. Um, we've started to see some uh, agreement now between China and the US starting to work together now that the United States under the current administration is once again taking a leadership issue on climate. Um, the United States has pledged to lowering its carbon emissions by the needed 50% by 2030. The uh, G7 countries have all committed to ending support for uh, overseas coal production. That's really critical if we are, again, to bring those carbon emissions down. We've seen some successes um, in the courts. Uh, Royal Dutch Shell was ordered to reduce its carbon emissions by nearly 50% by 2030 by, uh, the, um, by the Dutch court. Climate activists have made their way onto the ExxonMobil uh, board, um, uh, board of advisors. And so we're seeing some progress made. The Keystone XL pipeline, which James Hansen, the well-known climate scientist James Hansen once said would be game over for the climate, that's been abandoned. Um, we're starting to see Funders move away from funding new fossil fuel infrastructure. We're seeing a role played by the finance industry in denying financing to new fossil fuel infrastructure. But we still have quite a bit of work left if, again, we are to get onto that path that will keep warming below uh, catastrophic levels. Glasgow uh, delivered some reason for cautious optimism. Uh, we didn't get the bans on new fossil fuel infrastructure that many climate advocates were hoping for, um, or uh, you know, um, we, we, we didn't get an, an agreement to end all subsidies for fossil fuels. We didn't get some of the language um, that would, uh, language that would, um, mandate that we phase out fossil fuels over the next decade. Instead, we got weaker language to phase down fossil fuels. And that was at the due to the last minute lobbying. In fact, um, after an agreement had been reached, India in sort of violation of the uh, parliamentary procedure 
came out and said they wouldn't sign on to the agreement unless that language was changed um, to uh, change phasing out fossil fuels to phasing down. Now they had made a commitment to bring their carbon emissions to net zero by 2070. Now that's pretty late in the game. It's much later than most countries have committed to, but they are a, still a developing uh, economy. And that commitment alone brought um, the, the commitments, the net commitments coming out of Glasgow to the point where they now keep warming below uh, a projected, um, uh, I believe it is a, a projected uh, two to, uh, I don't think, uh, I have to remember the, the numbers now. Um, they bring warming, I believe, the, the low a projected two degrees, or at least um, some calculations suggest that the net commitments, the near-term and long-term commitments from various countries now bring projected warming for the first time under two degrees Celsius. If all of the nations of the world, um, of course, uh, keep their commitments. Now, that doesn't bring us down to one and a half degrees Celsius. So even in that scenario, we need to do more work. Uh, we need more stringent commitments from uh, the major emitters uh, of the world. And we need all of the countries to make good on their existing commitments. Now, that, you know, uh, the fact that we're not there yet uh, led some climate advocates to declare, you know, COP26 uh, a disaster and to uh, declare the entire process dead. And some even argued to abandon the Conference of the Parties process, the UN FCCC framework. Um, for reaching global multilateral uh, agreements on climate. Um, let me tell you, climate change deniers, professional fossil fuel funded climate change deniers love that language. They were more than happy to blast that in their, um, in, in their publicity, uh, to this idea that the UN Climate Summit was a disaster, um, that it accomplished nothing, and that nothing can be accomplished um, through these global multilateral negotiations. Because again, if we decide to give up, um, if we give in to sort of the doom and gloom and throw up our hands in defeat, well, that plays right to the agenda of the major polluters. They don't care about the reason for inaction. They don't care about whether you don't act because you think climate change is a hoax or you don't act because you think it's too late to do anything about it. There's just no way to solve the problem. Either way, it plays into their agenda of inaction. So we have to be aware of that. And we have to recognize in our messaging that while, for example, COP26 didn't produce what many ad climate advocates would have liked, um, it did put us on a path where we can start to see keeping warming below those dangerous levels with additional commitments. And the good news is that the countries of the world aren't going to wait five years to renegotiate those commitments, to ratchet up those commitments. Um, next year, there will be another meeting. Um, China, India, the EU, the US, um, all of these countries coming together. Uh, again, one of the problems that needs to be solved, part of why India was sort of defiant about making a commitment to phase out their carbon emissions is that the developing countries or the rather the industrial countries of the world, the G7, G20 countries of the world did not live up to the commitments they had made to provide financing to the developing world to help them build clean uh, renewable energy infrastructure. So clearly there's a role both on the side of the developing countries and the industrial countries. And there's going to have to be a fair amount of negotiation um, uh, back and forth over the next year so that when we do revisit these commitments a year from now, there is the potential to see binding commitments that really do get us on that path to keeping warming below that catastrophic one and a half degrees Celsius. Again, the obstacles to doing that aren't physical, they're not technological. At this point, they're entirely political. This is an article that just came out. Um, 
There's a lot of gloom and doom in the Beltway media's treatment of this issue. They want to declare it dead as well, uh, build back better. Um, uh, in reality, um, it looks like there uh, is real potential for the climate provisions in the Build Back Better bill to actually make their way through Congress this term. And if they do, if they can get 50 Democrats in a tie-breaking vote by the vice president to pass those provisions, then that actually backs up the Biden administration's commitment. That provides a framework where we can meet our obligation to lower our carbon emissions by 50% within the decade. That then gives the United States far more stature and authority in negotiating with China and other countries. Um, and there's a ripple effect. And so progress here in the United States really is critical to uh, global progress on climate. And, and that's where our focus here in the United States needs to be in the months ahead to make sure that we do get the sort of action, the, the sort of legislation that allow the United States to go back to China and India and the other countries of the world and say, we're doing our part. Now you've got to do your part as well. And you know what gives me optimism, people often ask. Um, it is you know, the fact that you know, there were 40,000 strong youth climate advocates marching in the streets of Glasgow. And yes, yeah, sometimes they become a little disillusioned. And sometimes, you know, I would say we need to help them see the agency, see, you know, the solutions that exist, look past the, um, the, the, the dreary images that they sometimes see and the fraught politics that we sometimes encounter help them to see that there is a path forward because we need the moral clarity and the moral authority of their voices out there really forcing the issue and recentering the discussion where it needs to be because too often it's focused on the science or the economics or you know the policy apparatus um, this is about ethics it's about our ethical obligation not to destroy this livable planet for future generations. And there's still time to make sure that that not be our legacy, but that window is starting to close. And so again, you know, to emphasize the terms that I've been using here, there is great urgency, but there is also agency. It isn't too late to solve this crisis. And I will leave it there. And I look forward to fielding uh, any questions. Stop the share. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, I neglected to say at the beginning, we can take questions in uh, two different formats. One is through the q and A. I I noticed there's already three questions lined up in Q&A, but we can, we're also happy to take live questions. I think we can do that uh, if you raise your hand. You should see that on your panel, and then we'll try to call people. We encourage live questions when we uh, can do that. And Chris, do you want to help run the chat questions? Uh, maybe, why don't you go ahead and start us out in chat, if you will? I, I see some questions already there. So you guys will curate the questions and then just ask me. Yes, we'll, we'll do that. Yep. Great. We'll do our best. <laughs> so. Um, all right, uh, so just looking down, there's a couple of longer ones I'll read ahead. Um, the first one is uh, specifically about what are some book, re book recommendations regarding the climate change and the policy issues. Um, uh, I'm sure you'll mention your own, but I'm sure there are other ones that you'd like to, to share as well. Yeah, thanks, Chris. There, there are a bunch of really good books out there right now, and invariably, you end up forgetting to mention some of them when you're asked these sorts of questions. But uh, All We Can Save, um, which is by a group of authors, all, all uh, women uh, scientists and women communicators, um, uh, it's, a, it's a very uh, compelling uh, book that focuses on, on, on sort of the solutions. Um, there is the uh, Project Drawdown, the latest um, Project Drawdown uh, uh, book, um, 
which again outlines all sorts of solutions, um, personal, individual, collective. Uh, there's a really good book um, by uh, Leah Stokes, and, and I'm trying to remember the name of it, um, but it's about climate policy. Leah is at the uh, University of California, Santa Barbara, one of the uh, leading climate policy experts. And um, if, you, if you Google her name, uh, I'm sure you can find her book. Uh, those are a few that um, sort of come to the top of my mind. Uh, there's also some really good fiction. Uh, actually, um, uh, there is uh, the, the latest uh, book um, uh, by, and I'm going to forget um, his name, but it's, uh, I know it's in my uh, somewhere here. Uh, there's my collection right behind me. Um, um, but uh, the uh, Ministry uh, of the Future by uh, Kim, Kim Stanley Robinson. Kim, Kim Stanley Robinson. Yep. <laughs> Um, and it's fiction. Uh, actually, I've done a couple events with uh, Stan um, because, well, he comes at this from the standpoint of uh, fiction. The message that emerges is very similar to the message that comes, for example, from my entirely nonfiction sort of um, a framework uh, described in, in the new climate war. But he uses storytelling and narrative to sort of um, to both depict, you know, there are a lot of dystopian climate books out there um, that I think potentially can lead to disengagement. Um, they, that, that, that sort of portray this as an unsolvable problem. What I like about Stan's book is that it's not, it's almost a utopian um, sort of uh, story. Um, bad things happen in the book and I won't give away the plot some really bad stuff happens. We already see bad stuff happen. So it's not hard to imagine that even worse stuff happens in the future um, before we really get serious. But he does portray a world you know, where we do ultimately come to grips with the climate crisis. And you know we find a way to live viably, um, uh, productively to flourish and deal with not just the climate crisis, but the, the larger uh, struggle to live sustainably on this planet. I think there's an important role for those sorts of fictional narratives. Um, and um, so that's another book that I would recommend as well. And there are probably many others. Um, in The Guardian, uh, about a year ago, I recommended five uh, books, um, five recent books. And so if you go to The Guardian and you look up my name, um, you'll find my book suggestions. And among them are some of the books I've mentioned here. Chris, I see a hand up among the participants. Uh, can we alternate? I'll, I'll call on Philippe. Certainly. Montez. Uh, that sounds good. Do we have to promote him? Can you hear me? Good. Yes, we can. Yes. Um, uh, thank you, Professor Man, for an excellent talk. Uh, I don't have a video but I don't think I'm authorized to use it anyway. Um, I, I wrote to you before on a comment you did for one of the, I think the warden about the, the idea that is uh, COP26 or the COP mechanism, or there is nothing. And I propose that in this forum last year, Professor Dieter Helm uh, uh, laid out a different strategy based on economics and the, the, um, the, the, the a, a group of the willing so instead of multilateral agreements with everybody, just a group of the willing. And I think it's a very valid strategy. Have you heard about that strategy? Or can you comment on that one? Yeah, you know, I'm always careful with phrases like coalition of the willing because it has connotations um, in past political countries. But, you know, it's, it's, you know, I think what you're saying is Let's take advantage of, of those you know, nation states that are already willing to lead on this issue. Um, and, and certainly that has to be the case. I mean, the fact is that we do see some leadership um, in the EU. We do see some leadership currently in the United States. Um, of course, this all depends on the, the future of our politics. And so it's really critical that those who care about you know, the climate crisis vote on this issue and not just in presidential elections, but in midterm and off term elections. And if we don't do that, then we are going to lose the ability to um, 
you know, to participate meaningly, uh, meaningfully um, in, you know, in this global effort. And so, yeah, I think we have to provide incentives. Um, you know, there's something to be said for, you know, emphasizing the carrot as much or more than the stick, um, providing positive incentives for those countries that are willing to lead, incentives for them to, to uh, exhibit even greater leadership and, and cut their carbon emissions even more. Sure, that's all important. Positive incentives are very important. And, you know, and, and, and we need to use all of the, the tools in the toolbox as far as I'm concerned. Uh, didn't really talk about this in the talk, but, you know, how, how do we reduce our carbon emissions? We can do that through sort of, um, you know, uh, demand side measures, carbon pricing, subsidies for renewable energy. Um, uh, these are ways to, um, to decrease demand for fossil fuels um, using market mechanisms. And, and they've proven viable in the past when it comes to other environmental crises like ozone depletion, acid rain. But there are also uh, supply side approaches. Um, for example, banning new infrastructure, preventing new fossil fuel infrastructure is acting on the supply side of this. And so when people ask about what they can do, um, you know, when individuals want to know what can I do to impact policy, well, certainly participating in the political process, voting is really crucial, writing letters, putting pressure on your politicians, but also participating in protests um, and, uh, you know, protests against new pipelines, um, that sort of grassroots pressure has proven very important. It's played a role, for example, in providing um, a, uh, you know, when you see that sort of grassroots support for preventing new fossil fuel infrastructure, it provides the president for a mandate to say that, you know, he's not going to approve new pipelines. Now, the Biden administration is running into some problems with, uh, you know, uh, conservative stacked courts that to some extent are now reversing some of the executive actions that um, the government that the administration is trying to make uh, with respect to uh, you know, new uh, leases on uh, new oil leases, for example, in the Gulf of Mexico. But you know, there's a role for collective action, demonstrations, putting pressure on politicians um, and supply side measures as there are for sort of more wonkish um, you know, uh, market driven demand side uh, measures. And it, it's got to be both. It isn't one or the other, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, and, uh, thank you. Thank you. So there's a, there's a question, a longish question by Russ Johns, um, discussing some of the trade off issues associated with <clears throat> developing renewable energy and what the waste stream looks like. And the sort of the, the final line, he says, I want clean air, clean water, clean air, clean land, uh, and not just clean air. And so um, the, what's your, what is your approach to sort of uh, balancing the, 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 tr the trade-offs between the different sources of energy and getting to the electrification of the system and as well as removing um, the CO2 from the atmosphere? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And, you know, I think we all want those things, or I hope we all want those things. Uh, I'm not, actually not convinced we all want those things. I think that's part of what's fraught about our politics today is that we do have world, different worldviews. Um, but uh, many of us want, uh, you know, to leave a better planet behind for future generations. And, 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 and that means we have to find a way to live sustainably on this planet. That, that goes well beyond climate change. You know, for the, you know, we can think for, for the um, mathematicians and dynamicists among us, what we're trying to do is optimize, you know, we've got this multi-dimensional space and climate is just one axis in that space. Um, but we have, you know, overfishing, we have atmospheric pollution and water pollution. We have um, all of, you know, global plastic uh, pollution and the threat that comes with that. Uh, you know, um, habitat destruction, um, biodiversity, loss of biodiversity. Um, and there's a really, you know, there's a good literature about this. Um, it comes under uh, the, the terminology of planetary boundaries, um, you know, remaining within all of these different boundaries that define what it means to live sustainably on this planet. 
And so it, it's absolutely, I think what, you know, the, the question alludes to the fact that it's possible to take, you know, actions that might seem optimal if you focus on just one axis, but ignore the co-benefits when it comes to other impacts or the costs when it comes to other impacts. And there's been a lot of discussion, for example, about the reliance on, you know, rare earth metals um, in the manufacturing of, you know, solar and wind uh, technology, um, you know, mercury pollution, uh, bird catch and, and, and bat catch, you know, birds and bats getting caught in wind turbines. Um, you know, it's possible to take actions that help out with our carbon emissions, but, you know, actually could make things worse for some of these other problems. And so we do have to be very careful about that. That having been said, I don't really believe that Rupert Murdoch cares about birds. I really don't believe he cares about wildlife. I don't think that's who he is, but he is happy to use Fox News and the Wall Street Journal and his media network to convince environmentalists that renewable energy is going to kill off the birds and the bats. It's going to pollute uh, the, um, you know, uh, our oceans and atmosphere. It's one of the tactics I talk about in my book, um, The New Climate War. Um, it's uh, a way to, um, it, it's used to divide the environmental uh, community by convincing some environmentalists that renewable energy um, will actually have all these adverse impacts. And, and often it's based on, you know, simply <clears throat> misstating the facts and, and vastly exaggerating uh, some of those environmental costs. Uh, and a good example is Michael Moore's recent film, Planet of the Humans, which is really almost a, a caricature of, um, you know, and, 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 and it, it, it's a film that got a lot of play in conservative media. You know, the, the Murdoch media empire loved this film because it was pitting environmentalists against environmentalists and arguing that renewable energy is going to destroy the planet and that we really need to do is limit global population. And so there is lots of rhetoric um, and uh, lots of hyperbole when it comes to this conversation. And some of these you know, arguments are, some, some of these sorts of lines of argumentation are used to sidetrack the discussion and to create division and to exaggerate the impacts of wind and solar technology, for example. Um, that having been said, it is reasonable to ask the question, can we continue to, you know, live in a resource-driven, global economy? Uh, is that compatible with a sustainable existence on this planet? Um, do we want infinite growth? Is that what we should be striving for? Is that the be best possible planet? How many people can this planet meaningfully support? These are all worthy questions to ask, but we have to pursue them in a way that's sensitive both to all of the, the fraught issues that arise when we have these conversations. Um, in, in particular, you know, conversations about limiting global population, um, there's sort of an ugly underbelly to, to some of that when it comes to you know, uh, issues of ethnic cleansing and um, you know, the, uh, the mistreatment uh, of, um, of, 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 of racial minorities. Um, so it, the problem is we have to solve all of these problems. We have to live sustainably on this planet and we have to do so in a way that's just and respects basic issues of justice, um, generational justice, racial justice, social justice. Um, I don't know the solution to all of these problems. Um, I'm focused mostly on the climate problem but I do recognize that we have to have a larger conversation that goes well beyond climate and well beyond decarbonization. Can we continue to, you know, to live sustainably on this planet with a model that seeks infinite growth and continued use and exploitation of finite natural resources? Um, that's a rhetorical question because we know the answer to that question is ultimately no. And it means we do have to find something better. Chris, I'd like to jump ahead to another renewable energy question. It's one that uh, 
I'd like to hear an answer for myself. This is from Carl Mirzajewski. Pardon me if I pronounced your, mispronounced your name, Carl. Can we rely on solar and wind to provide a base level electric power in mid-latitude regions like North America and Europe? <clears throat> Germany was one of the most progressive countries in adopting renewable methods and after abandoning its nuclear generated sources is currently experiencing energy shortages, causing the country in some cases to start burning lignite to fill the gap. So, so that's, that's the question. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, you know, it, it, and it's funny, I, I talk about this in the book. Um, there is this great example of um, a, a Fox News talking head um, who was, uh, you know, they were talking about solar energy and, and why we're not using more, you know, solar energy here in the United States. And, and, and the guest brought up uh, Germany. Um, and the host said, well, okay, Germany, but they've got all that sun. <laughs> um, no, actually, and, and, you know, a number of experts came forward and said that, no, actually, you know, Germany gets far less uh, sunlight on average than, than the United States. Um, so sometimes we see this argument sort of uh, take on an almost absurd or cartoonish uh, sort of character. But you know, there, there are some um, real questions, for example, about, you know, uh, base load, right? The sun isn't always shining. The wind isn't always blowing. Now, I think there has been a conflation of two different things over the past few months. We're sort of rebounding from this extreme global recession. We're seeing levels of economic growth um, that we haven't seen in many years. And there's a huge demand right now on resources and energy because of that. And so we, we hear about you know, how supply chains have been interrupted and stressed and, and energy production is experiencing those same constraints. We're just asking a lot of our infrastructure right now as we try to rebound quickly from this recession. And so there are some short-term challenges that we are indeed facing right now that don't necessarily translate to long-term challenges. And it's important to keep that in mind. The struggles that we're undergoing right now as we come out of the pandemic don't necessarily translate to the, 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 the real long-term uh, challenges that we face. But those long-term challenges, you know, some of the things that, that you mentioned are legitimate long-term challenges. How do we iron out the sort of um, you know, the, 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 the intermittency of many of these renewable energy sources. And I, for one, have argued, uh, first of all, a lot of people like to say, well, you know, batteries, we don't have the battery technology. Well, batteries are coming a long way and it isn't just batteries. There are lots of things we can bring to the table when it comes to energy storage. So we do need energy storage. We need to be able to, you know, capture the surplus energy when the wind is providing more than we can use and the sun is providing more than we can use rather than throw that away because we can't you know, deploy it um, to the grid, we need to store it. Um, and you know, battery technology is part of it, but there are also things coming along like molten salts, uh, uh, heat storage um, uh, you know, is, is a heat storage um, sort of uh, medium. You've got pumped hydro, you know, it's a pretty simple idea. You've got lots of energy, well then move water to a high elevation um, and you can then reclaim that potential energy that you've created at a later time. So that's part of it. And I personally think that uh, green hydrogen, not to be confused with blue hydrogen, and we can talk about that if you want to, but there is a real role for um, green hydrogen. Um, hydrogen cells, you know, basically you run a, a electrolysis um, and you create hydrogen gas um, and, and that can be used as, as a fuel. Um, it has to be done safely, but there's a lot of progress that's being made right now when it comes to uh, green hydrogen. Hydrogen that's generated from renewable energy, when you have more renewable energy than you can use on the grid at that time, generate hydrogen, and then, and then you create these, um, the, the, this hydrogen fuel that can be used at a later time. There are issues of, of safety that have to be observed. And so I think we need to be thinking boldly and outside of the box, and there is a role for new technology, exploring new technology, but it's gotta be the right technology. I think these are the right sorts of technologies to be pursuing, not you know, geoengineering and you know, 
levels of carbon capture that are very difficult to imagine achieving. Um, not these sort of pie in the sky ideas that sound good and let you know, polluters kick the can down the road with this promise that we'll be able to do this decades from now. I, I think there's some real promising technology that we need to uh, incentivize right now. And I've mentioned some of what that is in my view. I know, I know we're not, I know we're not going to get to all of the questions, and so we're scanning through them to see which ones we're, we think are um, answerable in the, in short period of times. And one of them that comes up to I think as well. So that's okay. <laughs> so, but one of them is um, about what should Penn State be doing with respect to climate agency and urgency. Is there advice that we can we can uh, do locally here in terms of trying to do our best to take it, take action on these, these important questions. Yeah, I think Penn State, frankly, is doing a pretty good job there. Um, you know, there's this, uh, there's this joint venture with um, uh, Project Drawdown. And I know, Chris, you're, you're part of that here at Penn State. And, you know, that's really geared towards um, solutions. And some of those solutions are individual. Um, you know, I, I personally, you know, uh, sort of come down on the side of uh, you know, the, trying to emphasize the systemic solutions. Individual behavior is important. We should all be the best stewards uh, you know, of the environment that we can be. We should all decrease our carbon emissions, our carbon footprint as much as we can, but we won't be able to achieve the reductions that we need through voluntary measures by people who happen to care a lot about this problem. We need incentives that get everybody to act in a way that's conducive to solving the problem. So I think, um, you know, I think Drawdown does a lot for sort of conveying many of these individual, um, you know, uh, behavioral changes and, and uh, that we can engage in and ways that we ourselves can, can sort of act. Um, but, um, but I think it has to be sort of combined, you know, with the systemic solutions. And much of that, frankly, is political, and that's where things often become fraught for academic institutions that try to remain as nonpartisan as possible, that have a mission to be sort of nonpartisan. What do you do when you've got two major parties and, and only one of them thinks that climate change is something we need to deal with? That creates real pressures on institutions that strive to, by their nature, triangulate on matters of policy, at some point you have to take sides. And I think that's one of the challenges that we're going to see for state institutions like Penn State, um, where we, we need to at some point get off the fence when it comes to the political divide here. That's something that's very tricky for a university to do. All right. Jim, you have the next one if you have it handy. Well, uh, actually, I'd like to interject one of my own. I think we just have time for one, maybe one more. And it goes to something you mentioned about uh, Senator Manchin, actually, Mike. I mean, Senator Manchin has been the holdout or one of the holdouts on the Build Back Better Act. But uh, you had suggested that, you know, it might be possible to split out the climate part of Build Back Better and see if that would pass. Do you think that would be a good idea? I mean, maybe, is it possible that that might even retract, attract a Republican or two if the Democrats were to do that? Yeah, you know, Jim, I think you and I are alike in that we really, we would like to see a bipartisan, um, you know, solution here. I don't like the idea that it's just one of the two parties um, alone would, would be acting on the greatest challenge that we face. And you know, we saw, for example, from the impeachment hearings that there are six or seven Republicans who seem to be willing to depart from their tribe um, when it comes to you know, uh, a matter as serious as sort of the, um, the threat that was posed to our entire democracy by the actions of a president. I would like to think that some of those, there are maybe six or seven Senate um, Republicans, um, and, and some of them are obvious. Um, we've seen Lisa Murkowski talk a good game when it comes to climate on occasion. We've seen Mitt Romney actually gave us, um, you know, the, uh, 
the 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 idea of, uh, you know, when he was a governor of Massachusetts and they were uh, em employing a carbon tax um, as a way to deal with carbon emissions. So, yeah, I do think that there's a possibility of, of, um, of seeing some Republicans sign on to some sort of climate bill. I mean, just the fact that Manchin is, has indicated he's willing to, you know, support some of these climate provisions. He's heavily invested in coal. He's very closely tied to the coal uh, industry. And so if there are conflicts of interest among Republicans, there are at least you know, as large conflicts of interest uh, on the part of, of someone like Joe Manchin. And yet he's indicated that he's willing to come along. I think he wouldn't be saying that, frankly, if he didn't think that he could bring some Republicans along because he has been committed to you know, not moving forward on purely partisan votes on these sorts of things. So I do think there's a chance for that to happen. Um, I think if it's split off now, of course, then you get into the fraught politics. Um, are progressives going to be happy if, if climate is now peeled away from many of the other sort of um, provisions that they would like to see on health and education, et cetera? Um, and then it gets down to sort of political consensus um, and, 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 and party politics. Um, and so it's not going to be easy. And it's not clear that the that the road to climate policy um, is any less fraught if it takes a bipartisan approach than if it takes this um, democratic only approach. But given the choice, I would like to see some Republican buy-in myself. I think there are some Republicans who want to be on the right side of history. Let's give them the opportunity to be. Good, I, I totally agree with you. Well, you can give a talk about this next time and I will. <laughs> <laughs> well, Chris, we're at about 13 minutes after the hour. Maybe we should, unless there's one more that you want to promote, maybe we should cut it off here. And uh, I, I, I would just say that the, the questions are, are very un, in line. Many of them are very similar. And I think that Mike's already you know, sort of addressed many of them and so really good I think, uh, we're all great questions. it's really yeah hard to pick and choose in this particular case so yes let's thank mike and uh give him his applause thank you very much. and uh we will uh adjourn until next week uh when erica smithwick will be talking so excellent okay thanks, thanks so, much. so much everyone okay